Welcome to the newest episode of Beyond the Fame with Jason Fraley. I'm your host, Jason Fraley, picking the brains of the top filmmakers, musicians, and artists of our time. Molly Tuttle is nominated for Best New Artist and Best Bluegrass Album at the upcoming Grammys in February. We spoke about her powerful recent album, Crooked Tree, reminding us that it's good to be different than the other, quote, normal trees that wind up in the mill machine. Hey, Molly Tuttle, hey, thank you so much for joining us on WTOP. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, we are talking because obviously, you know, Crooked Tree is, you know, Grammy nominated album. You're up for Best New Artist, Best Bluegrass Album. And I actually, by the way, I got to give a shout out to my wife. She turned me onto your music, uh, like, I don't know, almost a year ago, probably. They, her company ran sound for Appaloosa Festival for you down in Virginia, <laughs> Showtime oh, Sound. Awesome. Um, all the crew awesome. came back and they said, you have to check out this artist. And we did. And now it's been nonstop on our Pandora. It's amazing. But anyway, <laughs> so we are talking uh, because you're doing a new digital deluxe version. Explain what, what's a little different about this version. Yeah, well, we had our album release show in April when the album came out. We played the Station Inn, which is kind of a historic venue here in Nashville for bluegrass, at least. Like there's bluegrass basically seven nights a week there. And um, it's kind of in an area that's been really heavily developed lately, but the station in has kind of been there for a long time. And it's, it's a bit of a hole in a wall in the wall. Um, but it's super vibey and has so much bluegrass history. You can just feel it when you walk in. Um, so we wanted to do it there to celebrate the release of Crooked Tree, which is a bluegrass album. And, um, we recorded the whole show and had Jerry Douglas sit in as a special guest. My dad was out there. He came and played with us, um, so we took two tracks from that release show and and put it in with the album. We did Castalea and Dooley's Farm. Dooley's Farm has Jerry Douglas playing on it. And then um, with my touring band, because they were they weren't the exact same band that was on the the original record. Um, and I wanted to get into the studio with them because we hadn't, even though we've been touring all year, we hadn't really um, recorded anything yet. So we went in and did one song that I've done for a really long time. I learned rain and snow when I was probably 13 years old and um we recorded that song I've played that live for years and then we um that song was kind of made popular by the Grateful Dead but it's a really old ballad and so we decided to choose another dead song um to give people a new one that we hadn't done before and so we recorded Dire Wolf and then we realized well it's winter time and both of these songs are kind of wintry and they're also kind of like about murder and a little spooky so it felt <laughs> felt appropriate to be putting them out as we're heading into the colder season. Absolutely. So, and, and the, the deluxe version, is it, is it out now or is it come out in the holidays or it is? Yeah. It just came out. So people can check it out now Four new tracks. There's the two live tracks and the two little uh, grateful dead songs. Great. Well, there you go. Perfect little stocking stuffer. <laughs> Whether you own the album or not, you get the deluxe version here. All right. Well, what was it like really quick? What was it like, you know, when Grammy nomination morning when you saw that you're up for not only best bluegrass album, with which is a huge honor, you know, for, for the genre itself, but also up for best new artist where, you know what I mean? That's that's like across genres you're competing. That's the best new artist of, of every genre. And you you made the cut for that. That is so cool. And I think you got a shot at winning. But what was it? What was it like Grammy morning here seeing that roll in it was surreal like I was I woke up and I was like oh my gosh it's Grammy nomination day I was really hoping for best bluegrass album I felt so proud of my album and it's kind of my first real full-on bluegrass album even though I grew up playing bluegrass um I hadn't made a real bluegrass album until this year and so that's what I was set my hopes on but I was trying to prepare myself for like okay it's okay if I don't get nominated for anything um, so I saw the people started texting me. I was on a call with my manager and people were texting me congrats. And we both looked up and saw Bluegrass album. We're like, great, we got it. It's so exciting. Such an honor. Um, and then like a little bit after that, I wasn't really paying attention anymore. We were on this call and suddenly I got a new wave of text messages that were all like in all caps, like <laughs> holy crap what's going on this is crazy congratulations and I was like what happened and then we looked up and saw best new artist and I was like oh my god it was surreal such a huge honor it's definitely one of the the highlights of my career so far 
Oh yeah. Well, if you look at like, you know, at least just the winners of the past couple of years in, in best mm-hmm. new artists, Dua Lipa, Billie Eilish, Megan Thee Stallion, Olivia Rodrigo. And if you ask me, Molly Tuttle would, you know, go nicely on the next, you know, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good five in a row. If you ask me, if, if it happens, we'll, we'll be pulling for you. Oh, thank you. Well, well, uh, let's talk about the album that, you know, we kind of went into what's different about the deluxe version, but let's, you know, just hit pause for a second talk about the actual album itself you know not just the deluxe version but the actual thing that's getting nominated here um uh i tell me i mean obviously the the title track the title of the album um i think it's such a it's such a not only just genius lyrics but i just th- love the just the message behind it you know that, that the crooked trees are the ones that don't fit in the mill machine so if uh you know if it's okay to be a little different and a little you know out of the, the norm because those are the ones that grow out and free but t- i can't use the sound bite if i say it so well, what does the song mean to you what caused you to write it um well i wrote that in with my friend melody walker and and we both grew up playing bluegrass in california which in its own way, it's kind of being a crooked tree already. The people don't really think of bluegrass when they think of California, but um, <laughs> we both had experiences when we were kids that that led us to feel like we had things that we needed to overcome. And for me, that was um, losing my hair. I I was I developed alopecia areata when I was three years old. Lost all my hair. It never grew back. I still am completely bald. I wear wigs. Um, I started wearing wigs when I was a teenager, but it took me years to really accept that part of myself and to open up to people about it. And then like, I think a lot of people who have maybe similar experiences go through this where then you start seeing it like, oh, well, it's actually, even though it's really hard and it's, it's definitely not all positive. It's really brought some positive things into my life. And it's actually made me a way stronger person and, and have a lot more empathy and be someone who can help others. Um, so it's kind of given me this superpower in a way that I think has helped my music a lot because music was always something that I turned to when I was struggling. Um, and so I really wanted to put that message into my music because it's so important to me that um, that to help others feel comfortable with who they are and to also share my story with um, something that's been a really big part of who I am and a big part of my life that I've had to um, learn to accept. And then it's been like one of the biggest learning experiences for me is just living with alopecia and and being different um and it's funny like with the grammy nominations how we were just talking about that like (laughs) my boyfriend was saying like you're really you're kind of a crooked tree for this category (laughs) and it was true (laughs) when we're looking at the past winners i was like yep (laughs) it's kind of appropriate in a way I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure there's tons of other people that can relate and your music is an inspiration. You know what I mean? So yeah, keep, <laughs> keep on, keep on doing it. Um, well, you sort of mentioned growing up, uh, let, I'd love to hear your, your sort of your quote origin story. <laughs> you're so you were born yeah. in oh, what Santa Clara, California at 93. Yeah. Um, wh- what sort of music did you get into? Like, was it always were you like a bluegrass fan as, as a kid or did your parents play? I, I you know, I want to know sort of what, how you got bit by the bug. Yeah. So I guess it all started with my dad who grew up in Illinois and he, his dad, my grandfather played banjo and loved bluegrass. And um, so my dad kind of learned from his dad and loved bluegrass. They went to bluegrass festivals when he was growing up. And then after he finished college, he didn't really want to stay on the farm. So he moved out to California because there was this great music scene in the Bay Area with like David Grisman um Tony Rice and Jerry Garcia and all these people there was like this really cool scene out there so my dad moved out there and then um was kind of gonna get a normal job and stumbled into a music store in Palo Alto where I grew up and they needed a banjo teacher so my dad started teaching banjo and then he started teaching guitar and all the other bluegrass instruments so that just became his um what he does full-time he still teaches all the time And so he taught me how to play guitar and I grew up just hearing so much bluegrass around the house. Um, But when I started going to the jam sessions and the festivals is when I really fell in love with the music. And then I always listened to other music as well. I kind of, I listened to what my friends listened to at school and that kind of infused um, in me this idea that I wanted to play bluegrass still, but I always felt like I wanted to stretch out and play other, other styles of music as well. Um, so, yeah, and it was I like a family band, good. right? It was like the Tuttles. You guys all played yes, together. My two younger brothers, Sullivan and Michael. Sullivan still plays um, in his band, AJ Lee and Blue Summit. They play full time. They tour all over the place. Um, and then my youngest brother, Michael, he'll play every so often, um, like at 
around when the family gets together sometimes he'll pull out a mandolin or a guitar but yeah we played we didn't do too many shows like we weren't on tour or anything but we did play around the bay area um sometimes on the weekends and during the summer it was fun yeah gotcha and then so uh, in addition to playing with the family and touring around you know the area and stuff didn't you also go to where where did you study was it berkeley college of music Mm -hmm. in boston is that right okay cool and then so take me fill the gap then for our listeners between Berkeley College when you graduate and then, you know, landing, I guess, or I guess putting together that first EP rise in 2017. How did you get from point A to point B in those early years? So, yeah, I always felt this kind of pull, pull at Berkeley that like, even though I loved being in school and loved learning so much, I, I felt like, oh, man, what I really want to do is like be out there touring. So I was at Berkeley for two and a half years and then um left school stayed hung around Boston but I was kind of planning my move to Nashville I moved to Nashville in 2015 and um had some friends but kind of pulled together people I knew to make my first EP and we just kind of recorded it in a little garage studio outside of Nashville um and that was my first time that's when I was really starting to like lead my own band and really try to um get my name out there Awesome. And then, of course, you followed up in 2019 with When You're Ready. And then after that, 2020, But I'd Rather Be With You. How did you sort of see yourself evolving between those two albums? Mm -hmm. Yeah, When You're Ready, um, that album, I kind of, I felt like that was, I had less time to write the songs. Like my first EP, it was all the songs that I'd written since when I started writing songs when I was 15. I had many years to kind of collect those songs and pick the best ones and then when you're ready it was like songs that I'd written just since I moved to Nashville and I'd made all these connections with co-writers and um, that felt like my first real record where we went into like a a real studio and it was a full-length record it was so exciting Um, but I didn't immediately want to like make a rootsy sounding album so it has like electric guitar and and drums and stuff so the challenge for me was trying to fit what I do into that more kind of like Americana or, or in the folk setting. And then with my next record, but I'd rather be with you that came out of the pandemic. Um, and we did it all quarantine styles. So I was learning to record my own parts in my house. And I sent them to Tony Berg, who was in LA and he produced them, got people to play on the tracks in their home studios. Um, and it was all covers. So That was an exploration for me of just kind of picking these songs that people might not expect from me and also just exploring further into different musical territories that were that I hadn't explored on my last record. Remind us what some of those covers uh, are, you know, some of the titles. Yeah, I covered um, a Rancid song and that was a band that they're from the Bay Area as well. They're a punk band and um, I loved them (laughs) as a bluegrass. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think there is some crossover between punk and bluegrass and I actually got to meet Tim Armstrong, who's the lead singer from Rancid and wrote that song, Olympia, that I covered. And he was like, yeah, I like I listened to so much country music growing up. And you can hear that kind of in the lyrics. It's there is some crossover there. Um, What else did I cover? I covered a Grateful Dead song, Standing on the Moon. That just felt appropriate for the pandemic when I felt like I was a world away from (laughs) everyone that I loved and missing my home and missing my family. Um. Let's see. She's a Rainbow is one that I still play live a lot. That's uh, I loved covering that one. It's a Rolling Stone song and it has this really cool piano line that I learned on guitar. That was my impetus for learning that song. Um, yeah. What was and fake fake Empire? Fake Empire, yeah, by the National. Yeah. That one also has a cool piano part that I really wanted to figure out on guitar. It's like a polyrhythmic thing they do on the piano. Um, so a lot of the songs were kind of like, ooh, what could I do on guitar with taking these like pop songs or or rock songs and and putting them to acoustic guitar was really fun. That's cool. And then, of course, before, you know, before you even put out Crooked Tree, you got you did some collaborating on other people's albums. Like I know you were with Bela Fleck. We interviewed a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, but what what how just memories of putting together that experience, because that did win. You know, we're speaking of the Grammys <laughs> that did win Best Blue Girl yeah. album uh, last year. Um, but I think you played on a couple tracks, Hug Point, Strider, is, was it, uh, Wheels Up, a couple ones. But what was that? What was that like getting to do that album? 
it was such an honor and it, it was scary though like this he writes such complex songs obviously I've been a huge fan of his music for a long time and he's just such a big hero and such a legend on the banjo that it's hard not to feel intimidating <laughs> intimidate yeah I was a little intimidated going into the session and but then I had to keep reminding myself like Bela knows what I sound like he wouldn't ask me to play on these songs if he didn't want me to sound like me so it was a learning experience where I was like okay I need to just be me it's gonna be fine it'll be like what he wants on this recording is me to play so I had to just embrace that and um not get in my head about it too much but that can be a challenge when like one of your heroes calls you up and wants you to come in and play on their album it's like oh I want to be like the best version of myself I want to play all this awesome stuff but he wouldn't have asked me if he didn't think I could do it so Absolutely. Well, I'm sure I'm sure he was pleased with the result. Well, and then it actually and then uh, by, the, by the time you got to Crooked Tree, it kind of it, it went both ways because then you had people guesting on your album featured yeah. on your album. Uh, tell me about working with Billy Strings on Dooley's Farm. <laughs> Billy Strings is just so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was awesome. He came in and, and sang his part and played some guitar stuff on it. It was just great. And he was exactly who I imagined on that song. Um so it was really special to have him come in and, and sing on it. Um, yeah, it was great. We used to be roommates when I first moved to Nashville and have just known each other for a long time. And anytime. We wait, wait, I got to hear that story. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> what was Billy Strings like as a roommate? Was he was he tidy? <laughs> <laughs> he was a great roommate, but, you know, he, his career was already exploding and we had more and more boxes of Billy Strings merch filling up the house. So after a while, I think he had to get a bigger place. <laughs> but were there like some impromptu jam sessions, you know, in the basement yeah, or living we had room? Like, or... We had neighbors who were musicians too. Lindsay Liu, who's a good friend of mine, lived across the street and she had a big house that she would host jam sessions and um, and house concerts. So there was always stuff going on. It was so much fun. Yeah, I, want, I, I would love a whole album with you two called Roommates at some point. <laughs> That's a great idea. That'd be amazing. Uh, and then, of course, so he did Dooley's Farm, and then Old Crow Medicine Show guested on Big Backyard. I mean, I mean, I mean, with all due respect to Darius Rucker, love the guy, I love his music. <laughs> but uh, you know, the original. Well, now I, I was going to say the original Wagon Wheel, but actually, the chorus I think was a Bob Dylan. So I guess there is no original. But anyway, what was it like <laughs> uh, working with Old Crow Medicine Show on Big Backyard? It was fun. Um, I wrote that song with Catch from Old Crow, and we kind of thought like we were writing it for his band. Um, and they went into the studio and didn't record it. And I was like, I love that song. Like, I would kind of like to record it on my album. Um, we kind of reworked the lyrics because it needed to feel personal to me. And then, but I was still hearing it with Old Crow because that's how we wrote it. And I just, I just had them playing on it in my head. So it was a lot of fun. We had them all come in and we cut it all live, wanted it to feel like a big backyard party. And they're just the perfect band to bring the party energy. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, we already I already geeked out about, you know, the title track Crooked Tree. And then we've mentioned Dooley's Farm and Big Big Yard and a couple others. But is, is do you have like a, a a personal I don't I know people don't artists don't like to say favorites, but, you know, like let's say like a if we can hold up a, a, a hidden gem on the album that you think um if whether it got more attention or not, like that, you that personally you're like that. I, I want people to go discover that track. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one that actually has become a favorite of mine that wasn't at first, but playing it live, it's it's been really fun to see how people kind of get into it in the show is Grass Valley. And I just felt self-conscious about that song. I didn't even know if I wanted to put it on the album because it's so autobiographical. I felt like it it was super different than the other songs um, and that it just kind of talks about my exact experience growing up and going to my first bluegrass festival. But ultimately, I decided it was important to have on the album because it kind of explains how I got to where I am today. Um, and I got my dad to sing on it on the album. It ended up being really special. And now when I play it live, it's like one that people comment on a lot that they really enjoyed getting to hear that story about um, how I kind of fell in love with the music. Literally, my wife off the side is going, that song is so good. Mouthing oh, it to me right so as we speak. <laughs> It is such a good song. Well, well, and, and tell me about the decision to put uh, She'll Change number one, because, you know, that lead off track is always important. But why does that one speak to you? Yeah, we put that out as the first single as well. And I think it was just kind of it was fun for me to have it first, because first of all, it starts off with a uh, in your face guitar lick. And I wanted to set the stage for the album. 
and show people that it's it's gonna be bluegrass and it's gonna be exciting and um I think the just the title of it she'll just when you think you know her she'll change um I felt like that was appropriate as the first track because you know I'm going in a sort of different direction and people might have thought I was moving away from bluegrass and now I'm going back to it so <laughs> yeah a little, little inside joke I guess Absolutely. And actually you played that on CBS set, what, Saturday morning or Sunday yeah. morning, one or the other. You, well, it was that crooked tree. Well, and round it out over the line. Tell our listeners maybe that don't know about, uh, aren't as familiar with your, your uh, songs or miss the CBS performance. Tell them, tell them uh, what over the line is about. Um, Over the line is kind of like a, it's like a road trip song. You're, you're driving, trying to find the person that you just can't, get away from you're kind of like hooked on this one person and even though you know they're bad for you you'll you'll do anything to be together so you're it's kind of like a traveling song where um it gets a little precarious but we don't exactly know how it's gonna end <laughs> <laughs> one toke over the line sweet jesus um <laughs> I love it. Well, dish on your band really quick, Golden Highway, because this album is the, I believe, uh, I could be wrong, but I think it's the first to feature your band, Golden Highway, that a lot of people have, have seen you. I know, I think you brought them to Del Fest, uh, Del McCurry's thing a couple months ago. Um, oh. But uh, just what makes them such a kick ass band to be with? Well, I think it's kind of my dream band. Everyone I called and I called up uh, my favorite musicians that I thought would be so fun to go on the road with. And and everyone agreed to be in the band. And so I'll just go through the members, I guess, of the band. It's Bronwyn Keith Hines on the fiddle. And we've known each other. We both went to Berkeley together. And I've just watched her evolve as a fiddle player so much. She, When I met her, she was playing Irish music. And then she decided she was going to learn to play bluegrass, which is not easy to switch genres like that. But she worked so hard. And now she's won bluegrass fiddle player of the year from the international bluegrass music association twice now which is just incredible to me she's amazing wow. shelby means plays bass with me and i love singing with her she um we met each other a little bit before i moved to nashville and became really good friends did one tour together um and it was so much fun so i just i love having her play with me I always feel so supported she's such a great bass player and such a great singer which is an, a rare combo and it's really great Kyle Tuttle um is an amazing banjo player he's one of my absolute favorites um I think his playing is so tasteful but he also really stretches outside the box with he uses a full-on pedal board and he's kind of has one foot in the jam world but then he can really play any style of of music um that you want him to play and then last but not least dominic leslie um is someone i've i think i met him when i was a kid like he used to go to all the festivals around colorado where he grew up and he played on the whole album um and then has been on tour with me all year and he's such an amazing player he's kind of similarly to kyle he can really play any style of music um and you hear influences from like early bluegrass like bill monroe but then he'll play like a crazy lick that sounds like a jazz like, like out of a jazz standard or something he's just he's <laughs> awesome that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I it, it it's a really is an amazing album. We'll tell, and whoever's listening to this, seriously, just go on to Spotify, Pandora, what hit hit your Siri button and say play Molly Tuttle Crooked Tree and whatever you got to do, have it pop up because it is just it's an it's amazing music from start to finish. Um, I know you're busy promoting it. Uh, what so what what's next though? Is anything percolating for for you know a, a follow up album or or are you still just sort of focusing on promoting this right now get through the grammys first <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i want to go back into the studio and make another record for sure and um but yeah we have a lot going on with the grammys and it's gonna be gonna be a fun winter for sure <laughs> awesome well we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and i guess final seconds just to bring it full circle if we have any other listeners who who maybe are young or actually of any age but uh who think they might be a crooked tree themselves give a little encouragement to keep for, for them to keep going and, and keep being keep being crooked trees in a world of straight trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hang in there i think everyone has something that makes them a crooked tree so um yeah it's all about just being who you are 
letting your freak flag fly when you need to. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we appreciate you joining us, Molly Tuttle. Uh, good luck yeah. at the Grammys. We'll be pulling for you for Best New Artist and the Bluegrass, oh, okay. too, as well. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much for listening to Beyond the Fame with Jason Fraley. Our theme music is Scott Buckley's Clarion. Remember to give us a five-star rating if you like what you hear. We'll see you next time. Explain your DNA on, on 10 cases, man. You're inside the police interrogation room with the alleged Potomac River rapist. I'm not guilty on any of this stuff. So calm, so reasonable. Could this be the man who terrorized women for nine years before murdering a brilliant scientist two decades ago? Experience one of the most fascinating true crime podcasts available. Join crime reporter Paul Wagner for Unknown Subject, season three of WTOP's American Nightmare series. Search American Nightmare Podcast on all podcast platforms. I wanted to take a second to tell you about an app I really enjoy. Living in the D.C. area is great, and Podcast D.C. gathers all of the local shows that I like all in one local app. Health, sports, local news, politics, and so much more. Podcast D.C. is the new local app with hundreds of D.C. area podcasts to choose from. I can earn exciting rewards just for listening and share the podcasts I love instantly. Available in the App Store or in Google Play, listen local with Podcast D.C.